God, that you are here in this place. I ask you to breathe upon your word tonight. I ask you, Father God, to put a fresh anointing on the words that are in your holy scriptures. And Father God, we will not fail to give you the praise, the glory, the honor that is due your name. I thank you, Father God, that everyone is going to be able to leave here and that they're going to, to have some nugget, Father God, that they can take out, that they can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone afresh and anew, with a new heart and a new vision and a new outlook in Jesus name all God's kids said amen hallelujah well I titled the message tonight preach the gospel and while that seems very simple I I, I just mauled around a hundred different titles and uh, God didn't speak to me like he did to Andy on Sunday so I just had to pick one Amen. So I just stuck with the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ that many times today is not being preached. Amen. We're hearing a lot of things besides what we should be hearing. But one of the things that I would say tonight is, you know, ever since the fall of man, man fell into sin. People have been in rebellion against the creator, right? Ever since the fall of man. And so we were born in sin. And we continue to sin unless we are upset by the gospel. And when I say upset by the gospel, I mean when your world is turned upside down because you've been living a lie and you've been living in a sinful nature and all of a sudden someone comes along and confronts you in how you are living, and while it may upset you for a moment, if we will listen to it, that sin that turned us upside down from the beginning of our lives, God wants to turn it up, upright, amen? And we need to be able to accept Jesus Christ so that we're not living in this upside down world as the heathen does, amen? And so when we think about, um, you know, I, 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 I'm just going to ask you a question tonight. Who is God? Because when I ask that question, I ask it for a reason. Because so many times you feel a tension because you almost draw a blank. What do you mean who's God? He's God. <laughs> and it's a question that really isn't being asked a lot today. Because... There's a lot of gods out there. There's a lot of gods out there. And it's creeping into our nation more and more and more as we watch time progress. And many of us know how to answer, or we think we know how to answer. But even if we do know how to answer, we have to have a realization and we have to come to the knowledge that we live in a very spiritually confused world right now. Very spiritually confused. You're not, but the world is. Many Christians confused, spiritually speaking. And so we've got to realize that when we ask a question, who is God? There are all kinds of different answers can come. And the most popular one in today's culture is God is whoever I say he is. God is whoever I say he is. Whatever I say is right is the gospel. No one looking at the Holy Scriptures to be able to debate with anybody anything. And when we, and, and, and I guess my whole thing tonight is if, because I'm going to be giving you a lot of scripture. But my whole thing tonight is I want you to know this. We cannot serve a God of our own imagination. Amen. Yeah. Because there is a whole world out there serving in a God of their own imaginations. They have believed some crazy stuff. They have nothing to back it up. It is not doctrinally accurate in any way, shape, or form. But because of an experience that they might have had or because of somebody that told them something that tickled their ears and sounded good, all of a sudden they think that they have, they have the corner market on the pulpit and they ought to be able to just be able to preach anything that they want to. But the thing about it is this. If I were to ask the question, what pleases God the most, do you know what the answer would be? <laughs> 
What makes God the happiest? I believe the happiest God is, is that we would know Him. Good. That we would know Him. It's that simple. Paul said it. I looked in Hosea 6.6, 6, a verse that says, and I've thought about it many times. We've heard it preached many times. For I, talking about God, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. I think that scripture is so powerful because God was literally saying, you know what, your religion doesn't do a thing for me, but I want you to know me. <laughs> religion doesn't do anything for God. Coming to church doesn't do anything for God. If you don't know Him, if you don't know Him, you're just going to another event. You're just going to another gathering. You're going to another assembly. But he wants us to know him. And Paul told us the same thing. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That was what we need to know. Yet every time we would look at a question to say, who is God? Sometimes we will draw a blank. We want to be biblical. We do. We want to be biblical as people. And at the same time, we want this acceptance. We want to be politically correct. We don't want to upset anybody, you know. And modern church has become so good at just putting on a show, encouraging people. You can live a better life if you have Jesus on your side. <laughs> your kids will be better. You morally, morally, you just need, need to live morally right. All these things it's telling us. But when, when it comes to what the, what the Bible really has to say about God, we are failing miserably because we are biblically, doctrinally illiterate. We don't even know what the scriptures say. And it's been so funny because in the last... Last week, I guess, maybe the last five, six days, I've really been focusing and trying to put my focus on just God, just focusing on God. And when I've been in prayer, when I've been, you know, in my worship time, I've just been focusing on God, like who he is and and seeing him seated on the throne and knowing that he's bigger than me and magnifying him and and not even trying as we were in here Tuesday, we were praying and I was not even trying to focus on what it was I wanted to petition him for or what I wanted to come and, and, and you know, and just speak to him and make my request known to God. I just wanted to come and I just wanted to acknowledge his presence. I just wanted to have my mind set on God, not on what he could do for me, just on God for who he is, because this is the creator of the universe. And sometimes I think that we try to bring him down here to our level and we, we literally put him down like he's a mere man and he's God. <laughs> he's the God of the universe. He's the God of all creation. And I think sometimes we lose sight of who he is. And when we lose sight of who he is, then we don't know who we are. And we become big in our own eyes, even on the things that we know to do that are right. We lose sight of all the glory goes to him. All of the honor goes to him. He is the reason that you live. Amen. He is the reason that you are here on this earth. But we get so busy trying to look like we're tolerant. We try so hard to give an appeal to this unbelieving world that we are, we are compromising the very words that are in this book. You know, I want it to be relevant, but I want it to come across nice. <laughs> Sometimes to be relevant, you can't come across nice. You just have to put things out there because it's more important, amen, that, we, that God, <laughs> God would, we would have his approval rather than man's approval. But yet as men and women, we just constantly are trying. You know, we fought through the seeker-friendly stuff and we've talked about it a lot in the last few months. And it's like, people, it's not working. The church growth today, statistically, is church to church to church. The statistics of new converts into the body of Christ that have never accepted Jesus before as their Lord and Savior are very, very low. Don't be moved by church growth. Don't be moved by that. Because a lot of people are just changing church. 
They just go for So you may add yourself in numbers, but where are the new converts? What is it that we are supposed to be doing? And so as Christianity is quickly becoming the, the scorn of the earth, not just in third world countries anymore. Now it's becoming the scorn of the earth right here in the United States of America. If you're a Christian, you're a hater, you're judgmental. They're, they're creating laws to silence you as we speak. What are we supposed to be doing? Because the truth of the matter is, is that we're supposed to be talking about God in a very spiritually confused world. Amen. Folks in church know the answer. You can stand for truth. Can you stand for truth? Or you're just going to shake hands with them. Because a lot of people don't want to have the conversation. I would rather keep things to where everything's okay and we'll just keep this one little area that we won't go there. Because I know if I go there with them that I'm going to break relationship or I'm going to, you know, we're going to have this little scuffle or some sandpaper feelings are going to come in our relationship and we're going to be rubbing each other the wrong way. And at the same time... <laughs> It is amazing to me that the gospel of Jesus Christ is being watered down. Yeah. Andy talked about it on Sunday morning. The gospel is being watered down. And I don't think it's because any of us, anybody, is doing it on purpose. I think it's because it's a ploy of the enemy because he doesn't want you to share God with the world. He doesn't want you to share the message of Jesus Christ. I literally have said for 30 years plus, John 3.16 is still as powerful today as it was the day you first heard it, the day you first got saved, and we can never get tired of sharing that same verse. Yet in the church today, we are so revelation hungry that we have forgotten the revelation of why we're even here, and that is to share the simple message that God so loved the world. We've forgotten it. We've forgotten what the gospel is even supposed to be talked about because we've been so caught up in self-help and motivational speaking and what can I do for me and how can I be blessed and how can I be prosperous and when was the last time you led someone to the Lord? Oh, don't ask me that question. Don't ask me that question. And I, I, I'm like, what are we here for? Okay? Now, I know you all talk about Jesus all the time everywhere you go. But it's not happening. It's not happening. So I went back, and I went back into the book of Acts. <laughs> and I'm going to just be honest with you. If you go read the book of Acts literally for exactly what happened, what went on, where they went, from town to town to town, it will turn your doctrine upside down. Yes. It'll turn it upside down. Yeah. Because you're not hearing that on mainstream church. You're not hearing what they did. You're not hearing the messages that Paul preached when he is standing up. Amen? When he is being chased, when he is being persecuted, when he is being scorned. But we need to walk in his footsteps for a little while, amen, and is what we're going to do tonight because there are many people worshiping an imaginary God and we as a church cannot sit back and be okay with that. We just can't be okay with it. Amen? And it doesn't matter what it looks like. They say they believe in God, but who is God to them? We have a Bible right in front of us, yet as a church, we've become mute to sharing the gospel and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. We're more into how you feel today. Well, God understands. You better be careful when you tell someone God understands, because you could be giving them a license to sin. Yes. I don't see anywhere. Paul said, oh, he understands. He understands. No, no, this is God. So we're going to take a look at Paul. And uh, I want you to go over to the book of Acts in chapter 17. We have to share the truth about who God is. <laughs> not what I see going on around me. Not what people are saying that's around me. Not how I think God's responding to my circumstances. But just that he's God. Amen. And that he's all I need. 
<laughs> Ever since we sang that song a month or so ago, I just keep hearing it over and over again. He's all I need. He's all I need. That's it. It's the end of it. He is all that I need. He is the one thing that my heart is desperate for. So when we go to look at Paul and we know what, what Paul's history was and we know how Paul got knocked off that horse and uh, had that road to Damascus experience. And we know when we look at Paul that he was a man that was once committed to stomping out Christianity, period. That was a mission. That was his mission. The Pharisee of Pharisees, he did not like the message of Jesus Christ. And so he went all throughout, wherever it was that he went, persecuting Christians, dragging them out of homes, having them stoned. He was all about thinking he was doing God, thinking he knew who God was. Let's put it that way. Thinking he knew who God was. And so he has this conversion and he begins to preach. And we go over to Acts 17 and I'm going to skip around a little bit, but I want to get to a lot of it because when, when Acts 17 first starts, Paul has landed in um, Thessalonica and he is preaching Christ. Okay. And when he come there, first thing he did was he goes into the synagogue of the Jews and in verse 2, it says, Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. Oh, point one. When you're reasoning with someone about Jesus Christ, let's start with using the Scriptures. Amen. Not what you think about Jesus. <laughs> Not what someone told you about Jesus. Let's reason with them by using the Scripture. Okay? Then he went on and said, explaining and demonstrating, meaning proving, that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. So Paul had a message that he is speaking. He is speaking Christ, suffering, rising again from the dead. And as he finishes reasoning explaining and demonstrating, it goes on in verse 4 and it says some of them were persuaded. Some of them. Not all of them. Some of them. Not everyone you reason with, you bring explanation to, and you prove that Jesus is Christ is going to be a believer. And we get hit with rejection. We get hit with it. Do you remember Andy's message about the, what are we going to be talking about? I want you to look at it through this scripture. How does that parable of what he's getting ready to talk about, the soils, the word and the heart. That's what it's all about. The word and the heart. As people proclaiming the gospel, we are only to proclaim it. We're not responsible for their heart. We're responsible for the word spoken, sown, to be obedient to God, to share and to proclaim, but I'm not responsible for their heart. I can pray for their hearts, but I'm not responsible for their hearts. Paul, who I would say, best preacher ever known. Can someone say that? If you wrote three-fourths of the New Testament, obviously he was one of God's favorite preachers, okay? <laughs> Some of them were persuaded. And then it says, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. Oh, that's interesting. It didn't really say they believed, but they were sticking around with the guys that were telling the stories. They were sticking around with who was sharing truth. So my guess here is that seed was being planted in a great multitude of people because of what Paul was preaching. Was Paul preaching blessings? He was preaching Christ, crucified, buried, raised from the dead, the power of the resurrection, all the way through. In fact, if you will go through all of the book of Acts, you will see common themes about what, in fact, if you go through any of the writing of the epistles, you will see a common theme of how Paul preached. Paul would always go back to creation. We never talk about God, the creator. When we are witnessing to someone, the God who created it all, <laughs> he made it all. We never talk about that. And here Paul, he would go from creation, 
He would talk about the fall. He would talk about redemption. And he would talk about the end of the thing. Every time he preached, he would go through that same scenario. You can go all the way through the book of Acts and you will see that common thread when Paul would speak. He would go through every sermon he preached. Create all redemption and the end of the age. All of it. Okay? And so some of them were persuaded. A few of them, not a few, not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. So what happens next is the Jews were not persuaded. They got mad. Let's just call the Jews the religious people of the day. There are people that are going to hear your message that are super religious and they don't want to hear what you got to say. And you may even think they're flying a Christian flag, but they are full of nothing but religion. They don't have a relationship with him. They're serving out of rules and regulations. And so here is these Jews. They were not persuading. They got angry. So they gather up this mob. And they are going to attack a house of Jason, it talks about. And they would seek to bring him out to the people. And so here he was, he was in Thessalonia. When this assault on Jason's house happened in Acts 17, what happened next was they decided they needed to get Paul out of there. So Paul leaves Thessalonia because of all the mess that's taken place. Because see, when you preach Christ, you're going to stir up the city. You are going to stir up religious yeah. spirits. There is a reason that when this church first started, that the, the <laughs> honest to goodness, the ministerial association at that time deemed this church within three weeks of my brother landing in Jackson, a cult. Yes. Within three weeks of being here. Why? Because he was preaching Something they're religious. They didn't like that we were going to bring drums in a church. They did not like that we did not sing out of a hymnal. That we had a transparencies on the wall. They did not like everything that is common in this area now. When we started, it was not common here. And it was, and it was literally... Now, were they doing that out of meanness of heart? No. It was a religious spirit that was ruling over this community when we came. My brother knowing it was ruling here when he came. And we kept pressing in and pressing in and we kept preaching and we kept preaching and he kept preaching and people kept getting saved and there was a time that the whole high school auditorium stood up in an assembly when my brother was told you got one shot Dave Chisholm to get into that high school and I promise you they'll never let you back in again and every kid in that school stood up to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior kids were meeting down in the alleys around the high school as we would go down there on lunch hours passing out tracts and praying with kids and stuff in the alleys because we weren't allowed on school property after that. So you had to just go in where you could get in. Amen? But here's what happened. And the assault on this house started way back then. Why? Because we were of the devil? Or was there a message going forth that a religious community did not want to open their ears to? Some believed. Some believed. Amen? <laughs> Let me just say this. Faith in Christ is not a matter of closing your eyes and leaping into the dark. Wow. Okay? It's based on revelation. Your faith is based on the revelation God has given you about His Son, Jesus Christ. Yes. It's what your faith is based on. All faith. Sometimes people try to walk in the dark by faith. But you can't walk in the dark unless you know the light. <laughs> When you know the light, when you know the sun, amen, then you're able to walk in the dark. But that's the way faith has worked. And what happens is when you walk in the dark and you don't have that revelation, you don't understand the full gospel, you don't understand this God the Father, you don't understand Christ the Son, you don't know what's going on, then you base your religion on emotions instead of on revelation. Okay? So, they've assaulted Jason's house. And Paul gets out of town. And when Paul gets out of town, we get into verse 10 and he goes to another place. Now he had been to Thessalonia and it said what? Some of them. Some of them believed him. But he goes into Berea. And when he gets into Berea in verse 10, it said, The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Here we go again. Same location, different town. <laughs> Same assignment, 
different town. And it said, those were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. Oh, wait a minute. We got a heart condition here. And it said, how were they more fair-minded? In that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, what? Many of them believed. And not also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. Now, wait a minute. Same message. Same place in the synagogue with the Jews. But some had a mind that had been searching and had been seeking daily. And all of a sudden, huh, many of them believed. Many of them believed. Why do we tell you you have to seek God? Why do we tell you you have to read your Bible every day? Why do you tell, we tell you you have to pray? Because that's the way you believe. <laughs> if you don't ever open it up and you don't ever read it and you don't know what it says, you're going off of someone else's faith. And when you get in the dark, you are going to be blown out of the water because once emotions get stirred up, revelation isn't even there to begin with to be able to take root on the inside of you so you can walk through that thing. Amen? And so many of them believed... So, when the Jews learned that the Word of God was being preached by Paul at Berea, they came and they stirred up the crowds again. See, I'm here to tell you, when we preach Christ, we're going to stir up the community. You're going to stir up the religious community. Do not expect it. <laughs> Lower your expectations when they want to talk bad about you. Don't get hit with rejection. Amen. You've got to know this is exactly what happened all the way through the book of Acts. I'm just giving you one chapter. Okay. And so here they were. They were in Berea. Many of them believed. And so next, Paul is going on to Athens. Okay. And I want to start in verse 16. Now, here he is in Athens. And while he's waiting in Athens, one thing is we got to learn what was so different about Athens that wasn't going on at Berea, that wasn't going on at Thessalonica. Because it's really important to know. Just say, same message, same message. different city. <sighs> okay, verse 16. While Paul waited for them, he's waiting for Paul and Silas. While Paul waited for them at Athens, it says his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews. Does that sound familiar? Here we go again. Different city, same place. And with the Gentile worshipers this time, and in the marketplace, not the church, not the synagogue, he's in the marketplace now, daily, with those who happen to be there. And so what happens is, here he is, and he's in Athens. And it says his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. And so what happens is that, well, let me keep reading and I'm going to back up there. Okay. And it said, and then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Do you know some people in town call you a babbler? <laughs> if you preach in the gospel, you will be labeled a babbler. And it's okay. It's okay. Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods. Because why? He preached to them what? Jesus. And the resurrection. Was he preaching self-help? Was he preaching ten ways to wealth? He was preaching Jesus. And the resurrection. And they took him and they brought him 
to the, to the or how, do, how do you say this? Aropagus? Somebody help me. Areopagus? Anyway, they took him there. Actually, the place they take him in Latin is known as Mars Hill. And you'll see in some translations that's what it's called, Mars Hill. And keep that in mind. So they took him and they brought him. And they said, may we know what this new doctrine is that you speak? And you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. <laughs> now, that's amazing to me. Because I'm like, Christ had already raised from the dead. And they're just now hearing about this? They're just now hearing what Paul's got to say? And so he goes on. Well, let, let's back up. First off, when Paul goes into the city of Athens, it says he observed the culture. It doesn't say he conformed to it. He observed it. I see what's going on here. But he didn't get caught up in it. That's powerful. He didn't get caught up in it. He didn't compromise. In fact, he was provoked. It should anger us when God is being robbed of his glory. Amen. It should anger us. It should provoke us to speak. Amen? So what really happens is this. When he went to Athens, we have to set the scene. Because Athens, while it was a city, and he went in to speak to them in the synagogues, to the Jews in the synagogues, when he is taken up on Mars Hill, Mars Hill was not, it was a place, but it was the place where we would call their Supreme Court was setting. And they would go up on Mars Hill, and they weren't going up there to put someone on trial per se, but they would go up there to review their belief systems, to hear what it is they would say, the very same place that Socrates, four centuries before, had been. Let's hear what his philosophies are all about. So they're looking at Paul, thinking he's bringing a new philosophy into town. And so he comes up here, and it would be no different than us going and sitting before the Supreme Court and then reviewing our case as to what we believe. Okay? <laughs> so they were standing and this court let me say this this court had this responsibility that they had to defend the gods they were going to listen to what he had to say to see if there was any truth in anything that he had to say because they were there because let's remember there were more gods in Athens than there probably were, were men because there were gods everywhere. Kind of like if you would go to India today. Brian said, Karen, there are gods. They are on every corner. There are hundreds and thousands of gods in India. Same here. We were in Athens. So they were reviewing his doctrine. He never backed down. He never got moved by what he had saw when he had went in to see all the idolatry that was going on. And it's interesting because the neat thing about it is no matter how many gods man's imagination comes up with to serve, there is never a fulfillment, there is never a satisfaction until you know the one and the only true and living God and his son Jesus Christ. You will never be satisfied. So once you get started with one idol and you serve in one idol, that one idol becomes two idols. And they very rarely talk about an idol in the Bible. They talk about idols in the Bible because you just keep going from one to the next because nothing satisfies him like Jesus. Uh, nothing is going to satisfy you like Jesus. That's not going to happen. So here they had thousands and thousands and thousands. And in the midst of it all, they had so many. This is so funny. They had so many gods in Athens that they now have idols to unknown gods. Yeah. 
Because we've done named everyone we could possibly name. So now we're just going to start making them up. Okay? And so that, that's the scene. That's where we are. Paul's went in. He's reasoned in the synagogue. He got a few of them believing there. And now he went out into the marketplace daily. And now he's been called up, let's just say, to the city council. Yeah. Explain to me why you're here and what you're doing. Okay? So he goes to address them where we're going to start in verse 22. Okay. And he said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. I think that's hysterical. <laughs> because it doesn't take long when you know God for you to perceive religion. Amen. You can smell it. Amen. A mile away. But he said, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Now here is Paul. Remember, he's observing everything he's seen. And he's seen all these gods. And all of a sudden he comes upon this one thing that says, that altar says, to the unknown God. Well, Paul, that's a fast mind. Whoa, I can show them who that unknown God is. I can show them. And so he goes on and he says, therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. You don't even know the God that I'm talking about. You don't even know who he is. And he said, God, who made the world, creation, and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. Here is he saying, wait a minute. As I begin to proclaim the gospel to you, let me share with you that God is the creator of the universe. He's the creator. He was provoked. He was not coddling them. He was very direct with them. You are full of religion. That's what he's telling them. You're full of religion. He wasn't holding anything back. He wasn't telling them how super spiritual they were or how super superstitious they were. He's literally front and center by himself and he goes in guns a-blazing. You have all these idols around you and I'm here to tell you there is only one God. <laughs> he is the one and only God. He is the one that created this universe. And I mean, he is holding back nothing. Nothing. And so... They had all these sinful concepts that they had made idols out of. And when we think of God in ways that are contrary to his word, we too make up idols for ourselves. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We make up idols for ourselves. Anything you think that is contrary to the word of God becomes an idol in your life. Because it's something you believe. It's something that you worship. That mindset that you worship and it may not have one ounce of truth in the Bible. You may have been mistaught something that was in the Bible. And at the same time, when sin comes in, idol worship will happen. We will make of ourselves idols. And you know, I just keep going back to this phrase that the Lord gave me. Imaginary God. There are people out there serving imaginary gods. Now we know that. But when it speaks it and it says imaginary, that means it's not real. That means, th in fact, oh, let me read. I'm going to give you some words. Isaiah 43, 10 through 13. You don't have to turn here. I'm going to read these quick. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed nor shall there be any after me. I, even I, am the Lord. And besides me, there is no Savior. That's pretty plain. Yes. So when you're up against the atheist and you're up against the agnostic, pull out Isaiah 
Tell him to read it because it's all over the place in Isaiah. He said, I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, said the Lord, that I am God. Indeed, before the day was, I am he, and there is no one who can deliver out of my hand my work. Will I reverse it? This is the words of God. He's literally saying, there isn't anybody else but me. So all these imaginary gods that people are serving, floating around in their own minds, thinking that they're right, even in church, <laughs> because there's people out there, despite the fact they've never read their Bibles, they've never, they've never graced the church with their presence, yet they will go around and tell you that they're Christians. They'll tell you they believe in God, but they, <laughs> on their own terms, on their own terms, not according to the word. These are the people. They can cuss. They can drink. They can fight with people. They can fornicate. They can hate people. But I'm still good with God because you can't dictate who God is to me. That's an imaginary God. That is not the God of all creation. I don't get to dictate to him who he is in my life. Amen? So here... He's literally saying, you know, man, I'm, I'm the Lord of the entire universe. Now, I don't know about you, but when God says that, and when we know who he truly is, why are we so afraid? Like, what do we have to fear? He's God. <laughs> the one and the only, the true and the living, there is none besides him. We believe in him. We trust in him. Yet we walk around full of fear. Because we don't know him. Wow. We don't know him like he wants to be known. <sighs> and so we get fearful when people challenge our beliefs. And we'd rather shake hands with it than address it. And I will tell you, there's wisdom in knowing when to debate. Because don't debate a fool. That's right. wow. But you can't always hide behind, I can't debate... When someone's heart is hungry for God, yes. we need to be biblically Amen. literate <laughs> that we can say, this is God. This is who he is. We can take them to these scriptures. Isaiah 45, 5 and 6 says, I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God beside me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Is he making it plain yet? Amen. Isaiah 42, verses 5 through 8. Thus says the God, the Lord. Who created the heavens? Here's creation again. Who created the heavens and stretched them out? Who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it? Who gives breath to the people on it? Oh, now he created us. And the spirit to those who walk on it. And now he breathed that spirit in us. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you. I will give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison. Those who sit in darkness from the prison house so that you may be wealthy and rich and prosperous? It's not what he said. Here's what I'm going to do. I will keep you. That means I'm going to be blessed. I'm going to be prosperous. I don't have to worry about it. That's a given. I don't even have to focus on that. It's a given. If you know him, you don't have to learn all those principles. It's a given. Amen? It's who he is. But he said, I'm going to give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to us, that would be the unbelievers. He's going to make you a light to the unbelievers. He's going to open blind eyes. He's going to bring prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. And then he said, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to what? A carved image. Here we go again, idols. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. And I am God, and there is none like me. 
I'm declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Isaiah 44 verse 24 says this, Thus says the Lord your Redeemer and he who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone. He didn't have any other God's help. I did it all alone. Who spreads abroad the earth by myself. Say, there is no other God. There is no other God. And this is where we need to be, church. We need to know him. We need to be able to look at these statements. We need to be able to read them. We, need to, we know it in our hearts. But do we really, really know it in our hearts? We think we do. All right, Karen, great message. He's God. We all knew that. <laughs> Did we? Because the last time we got fearful, we didn't know him like we needed to know him. The last time we panicked, the last time we worried, the last time we stressed out over something, we didn't know him like we thought we would know him. Because when we understand that he is mighty, that he is God, when we know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, we're conformable to his death. When we really, really know God, Psalm 27 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? No one. <laughs> no one. Why? Because he's my light. He is my salvation. Anyway, back to Acts. <laughs> you thought I forgot. <laughs> he literally says, This God does not live in temples made by man. I don't think we realize what a punch Paul threw with that statement. <laughs> He's literally saying, all of your high and mighty philosophies, with love, I've come to give you some truth now. This God I'm talking about wasn't made with hands. Your idols, you made them all. This is a whole different ball game. He is given a power punch. Notice, he doesn't debate evolution versus creation. He has one bullet, the gospel, Jesus Christ and his resurrection. That's how he preaches all the way through the epistles. Nothing changes. He reasons with them. He explains things and he demonstrates and proves to them through the holy scriptures. We're trying to get someone to believe us because we say it's so. And we think, well, no one wants to sit and go through the Bible anymore. When we were at camp meeting, Jeremy, Pastor Dave's son-in-law, made a statement. And it was so funny because I called Andy right afterwards and I said, you are not going to believe what Jeremy spoke tonight. Because him and Andy and I had just had this conversation in the office. And we were talking about people getting saved. It's more than just a salvation prayer. And Jeremy said, we've changed up the way we're leading people to Jesus. We're not just praying the prayer with them. We're saying, hey, if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, come in and talk to us. And they're laying out the scriptures. Why? They're not going to believe it just because you said so. The world we live in today is not taken just because he said, she said. They want information. They want revelation. So we need to be able to know how to go to the scriptures and show them that God is the God of creation. Talk to them about the fall. Talk to them about the redemption. Talk to them about heaven and hell. Talk to them about what they're signing up for, that they must count the cost because People say in the salvation prayer, the statistics would tell you most of them are walking away from Jesus because they never knew him, never understood a thing.
anything. They said that prayer to get you off their back or because they were moved in their emotions at that very moment. Amen. And I'm not against saying the salvation prayer with someone. By all means, do that. But you've got to follow up. You've got to make them understand what it is they're signing up for. Amen. He did not debate. He had one bullet. So in verse 26, he goes on and he says, and he has made from one blood every nation of man to dwell on the face of the earth. And he has determined their pre-appointed times and their boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that he might grope, they might grope for him and find him though he's not far away from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being as also some of your poets have said. And then he goes on and he keeps saying, he keeps spitting out all these gospel truths that we need to know. For we also, his offspring, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold and silver and stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. What's he saying? We're the offspring of God. You don't have to carve us. It's not about idols anymore. This is about a God you cannot see. You don't know where he is. He's, he's dwelling on the inside of you. He's not making temples by all of this stuff anymore. And he said, truly, verse 30, listen, truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked. But now what is happening? Commands all men everywhere to repent. To repent. The whole message of the gospel. This is what we're supposed to be preaching to people. The unbelievers. Those we're trying to get saved. Those we're trying to convince. This is how we're supposed to be doing it. He literally was telling them in a nutshell. Hey look. Grace has been on you. Grace has been on you. Grace has been on you. But now you've heard the truth. And now it's time you make a commitment. And now it's time you repent from your sin. Because when you really stop and look at it, you know, we can use the law. The law had a purpose. It was to prove to men that they had sin in their lives. Because we were all born into this sinful nature in an upside down world. And we didn't think we were wrong. But once the law come, it proved to men that now we are full of sin. Now no one wants to talk about the law. Don't you dare judge me. We use the law to show you that you need to repent of your sins as God has commanded. Amen? Amen. Thinking of God in ways that are not revealed to the scripture. We breed spiritual confusion into our culture because we are loaded with little tiny idols in our life and no one is addressing it. And when people see you, they label you as a Christian. And when they see you serving an idol, they think that idol is okay for them to serve as well. <laughs> we have to take this personally. We do not have the liberty to live however we want to. We have to live according to the Holy Scriptures. Are we going to fail? Are we going to do things? Yes, absolutely. And that's when we run to the throne of grace boldly in a time of need. And we get that thing right and we get up and we do it all over again. But at the same time, there are people that you know that would tell you they know God, but they don't have an ounce of fruit in their relationship that you would ever know they would call themselves a Christian. Come on, we can name them. We know them. We all know them. <laughs> There's a bunch of gods people are serving out there that there hadn't been a name put to. It's an unknown God, but it's still an idol. It's an unknown God, but it's still an idol. When we go back to Exodus 20, and I'm getting ready to close. When we go back to Exodus 20, I'm teaching you tonight. Because we need to know how to share the gospel. Amen. We need to be careful. We are accountable to preach the word. Amen? I don't mean you have to go verse by verse by verse like I'm doing. But when you are speaking to someone who does not know anything about Jesus. See, I was raised in church. I didn't have to tell, have someone tell me that God was the creator of the universe. That's not the case today. Most of this generation has not been raised in church. 
And if they've been raised in church, you don't know what kind of a church they've been raised in. So you don't know what their belief system is. So we have to go back. You have to get in creation. You have to get in the fall. You have to get in the redemption. And you have to get in heaven and hell and how this thing's all. You have to get that in to bring them to a point of repentance. It has to be there. Amen. And so here we have in Exodus 20. God spoke all these words saying... I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. <laughs> you shall have no other gods before me. That's more profound and deeper than we realize. He's not just talking about carved things. He's talking about our hearts. Yes. We cannot create this, these gods out of our own imaginations. Most of the people you run into church, they don't even know who God really is. Amen. They don't know who he really is. If they really knew who he was, they would be serving him with all of their hearts. Amen. Verse 4 said, You shall not make for yourself a carved image. Any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. But I'm showing mercy to thousands, to those that love me and keep my commandments. How profound is this? What is the first thing that Paul is speaking to these people? He says, I'm proclaiming truth to you. I'm not apologizing for what I'm saying. You don't know anything. I have the Bible. I have the truth. I know what I'm talking about. No matter what you and I do as Christians, they are going to hate us. They are going to persecute us. It doesn't make any difference. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. So why compromise your belief system trying to appease them when it is not going to work? Church has to quit playing games with the world. Amen. Thinking we're winning when we are not winning. We have to proclaim there isn't time to waste. What did he share with them? God made the world and he made everything else in it. He didn't go back to Genesis and give them a theology 101. He said, God is God. He made this world and he made everything in it. Do you know there's people out there that don't know that? They don't know it. They don't know there's only one God. They don't know there's a God at all. <laughs> but here's what happens. We're not called to prove the existence of God. We're not called to prove it. We're called to proclaim it. That's good. We're called to proclaim it. We think that we have to engage people with their intellect. But Paul really didn't. He just stated the facts. I'm not here to argue with you, and I'm not here to debate with you. Evolution isn't in this conversation. He is the God of all creation. End of story. That's my gospel bullet for you today. I'm not, I'm not here. I'm not, I don't debate with people. I'm not debating Holy Ghost with people. I'm not debating that kind of stuff with people. I, you, you can't win. You cannot win those kind of conversations because we're afraid that if the scientists would happen to disagree with us, that we can't say it because we know science, you know, is above God. Really? Since when? Yeah. Oh, they're brilliant. Oh, God gave them their brain. <laughs> but Scripture... Not science is ultimate truth. Now, once men's brains catch up to the real God, they'll see that science bows to God. Science bows to God. God doesn't bow to science. In fact, when their brains are 100% made whole, and ours are not, even the most intellectual of scientists aren't, <laughs> they'll know what ultimate truth really is. Amen? 
So all through the book of Acts, all through there, we keep seeing this same scenario. And we're going to finish it up. Acts 17, verse 31. And Paul goes on and he says, Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to us all by raising him from the dead. Oh, now we're getting into the redemption and we're getting into the resurrection and we're getting into the juicy of it. And he said, and then it says, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. While others said, we will hear you again on this matter. And Paul departed from them and verse 34 said, however, some men joined him and believed. Amen. Do you remember the soils? Do you remember where we are in Mark 4, where Pastor Andrew's taking us to? It's a heart condition. Did the message change? No. Was the message supposed to change? No. Was Paul responsible when they didn't believe him? No. He was only responsible to speak and proclaim the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? No other thing that we come up with. There is no other way that man can be saved except through God's Son, Jesus Christ. So we have to preach the gospel. Not what we want. Not what we think exhorts somebody. We have to preach the truth. Mark 16, 15. Jesus' words. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he who believes and is baptized will be saved. And he who does not believe will be condemned. We must begin once again to believe in the sovereignty of God to save sinners. Some are going to believe. Some are going to mock. Some are going to walk away. Some are going to say, I think I might come back and listen to what she's got to say again. Wow. I might hear you a little bit further on this. Can I come in and sit down and talk to you? But I'm not responsible for anything they do with what I put out. I'm only responsible, and you're only responsible to obey God by speaking the truth. Amen? Of the creation, the fall, the redemption, and the end of the age. You will see this. It's amazing. Because when you look at it, God miraculously saved some men in a city full of idols. Full of idols. And guess what? God wants to miraculously save men, women, children, elderly in Jackson County. Yes. Amen. But we have to preach the true living gospel. There is no other God. Amen. There is no other God but you. No other God. Don't get it twisted. Don't think that you can be a wordsmith and change it any other way. He wrote three-fourths of the New Testament. I think he knew what he was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. He even had the upper hand on the market because he knew what he had done to stomp out Christianity. And once he meets Jesus, he knew what he had to do to gain it back and redeem it back. Yeah. I'm going to listen to what he did. Amen. Go through, I encourage you, when you're reading through your epistles, you're reading through the works of Paul, listen to what he spoke. Oh, they said he didn't have eloquent speech. Whew. That's the gospel in a nutshell. In fact, it's one of, his one of his sermons that he's most known for was what he spoke on Mars Hill. Who are we that we think we can add to that and take away from it? Oh, we have to put it in our terms so that people understand it today. But don't twist the truth. Be cautious telling people God understands their sin. 
Because if you're going to say he understands it, you're going to have to follow it up, but he paid a price that you don't have to live a sinful life. You're going to have to pay a price that he commands men everywhere to repent. Or blood's going to be on our hands. That scares me. Blood being on my hands when I get to heaven scares me. That someone would even walk up to me in heaven that I don't even remember ever running into and God roll a film and say, hey man, I unctioned you to speak to that person and you didn't do it. And I'll praise him because someone else obviously did or that person wouldn't be standing there. But what if he shows me someone in hell that didn't make it because I didn't give them the truth of the gospel? That's weighty and that's heavy. But we know him. And my determined purpose is to know him more. And I know your determined purpose is to know him more. You wouldn't be here tonight. And while I know it's not a jump and shout message, if somebody doesn't get back to the basics of the gospel, people are dying out there. And this world's coming to a close. Somebody's got to get radical. Someone's got to be willing to turn a city upside down. Amen. We did it before. What happened? What changed? Because nothing changed here in the book. Amen. Nothing changed in the book. It's still go, preach, tell, declare, proclaim. Some are going to believe us. Whew. Glory. Some are going to mock us. They're laughing at you anyway. And if they're laughing at you, they're leaving somebody else alone. And some may say, hey, we need to talk about this a little bit more later. Can we talk about this a little bit more later? <laughs> and some are just going to flat out believe. And it's going to be glorious. It's going to be glorious. Amen. Does this help you? I know I feel like I'm in a... And, and it really, I, I could literally say this is probably Bible college year two or three. But God knows you're ready for this stuff. we got to just quit reading the book and just reading it, pulling out a verse, thinking it says whatever it says, and not looking at the whole content of what he's saying. Because I got a whole different look at Acts 17 when I started breaking it down. I got a whole different look at... Some churches are going to receive you and some aren't. Some churches aren't ready for you and some aren't. Some people are ready for you, some aren't. But it never changed the fact that he spoke the truth. So we speak Jesus. Amen? We speak Jesus. Stand to your feet tonight. Hallelujah. Whew. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord Jesus, there is none like you. There is none like you in all the earth. The one, the true, and the only God, we bow before you tonight. Lord, make us witnesses. Holy Spirit, breathe. Breathe in us the message of the gospel. Let us never grow tired of sharing the name of Jesus. Let us never grow tired. Let us never think that we are being too elementary with non-believers. Let us never think that we are not being effective if they do not respond. But Lord, keep us obedient to your word. Keep us obedient to the great commission. Keep us obedient, Father God, to proclaim and to preach and to herald with a sense of urgency, whether it is welcome, whether it is not welcomed, in the name of Jesus. Let us not be found as a mute church, but let this church have a voice in this community that will lead the unbeliever to the foot of the cross, that will lead people into the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, we praise you, we give you glory, we give you honor, and we just thank you. Bring increase, God. 
to the kingdom of God. As we do it your way. As we do it your way. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Speak the truth. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. With words and with your life. Amen. That God's kingdom would increase and he would get all the glory. Amen. All the glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Shoo.